Hello, reading friends. This is Johnny Alexander with Novelist Unwind. Really excited today to bring to you James R. Hannibal. I usually do not read someone's bio. Um, you know, I like to just talk to them and introduce them, but James's bio is so unique that I'm just gonna read it because he is definitely one of a kind here. <laughs> so here, here he is. Um, James is no stranger to Secrets and Adventure, a former stealth pilot from Houston, Texas. He has been shot at, locked up with surface-to-air missiles, and chased down a winding German road by an armed terrorist. That's actually the one that appeals to me. <laughs> I was like, ooh, I wish I'd been in that vehicle. Uh, he is a two-time silver, is it South, Southian? South Russian. Balshan, Balshan Award winner for his Section 13 Mysteries for Kids and a Thriller Award nominee for his Nick Barron Covert Ops series for adults. James is a rare multi sense synesthete. Is that? Synesthete. Synesthete, synesthete, meaning all of his senses intersect. He sees and feels sounds and smells and hears flashes of light. If he tells you the chocolate cake you offered smells blue and sticky, take it as a compliment. <laughs> this is truly one of the best bios. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes me happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> so James, um, author of the new book, latest release, The Griffin Heist. Here we go. Um, tell us about you. I mean... <laughs> And how you went from this adventurous life to writing about adventures. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my, one of the things that I tell writing students is you have to live before you write. Uh -huh. uh, and I probably lived more than most before I began writing. I, you know, I had a lot of interest as a kid. I wanted to be a fighter pilot and, and I went into the Air Force. And I got to do, I mean, I got to study counterterrorism at the Air Force Academy. I got to fly the A-10 Thunderbolt. Um, I got to fly the stealth bomber and with the stealth bomber comes some unique clearances. Um, it's a long story, but in the, in the short run, because I'm a, I'm a teetotaler, I don't drink. Um, and I wound up being a designated driver for a general oh. and that with my other record and my counterterrorism experience suddenly thrust me into a world of other things that I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, just being in the right place at the right time and, and being able to be a designated driver for a general changed my world and, and the things that I was able to do. And, and so I try to relate those in, into my fiction. And, and of course, I've, I've had to clear the first three books that I wrote. I had to clear through uh, security offices to make sure that they were OK. Uh, were those the books for the kids or were those the Nick? Baron series. They were the they were the Nick Baron series, and after the third one, which was uh, Shadow Maker, um, the the military gave me carte blanche. They said you've done three three novels, and we haven't had any major issues. Um, you've been real good, so um, we're going to let you uh, write with freedom. Oh my goodness! Wow, wow. Well, I'm enjoying um, the Griffin Heist, and um, it certainly is is a thrilling i mean your writing has been compared to tim clancy i sort of saw it as daniel silva i don't know if you're familiar with him well, i love daniel silva that's a big compliment <laughs> yeah yeah i'm a big daniel silva fan too of course there's a general market but um i liked and and i read this in in your q a but i also have picked it up too it's so interesting because you're taking it from a rookie's standpoint instead of the person who's been in the field forever and ever and maybe jaded and seen too much. So talk to us a little bit about um, your main protagonist. You've got several characters in this book and they're all very distinct and very unusual, but tell us about Talia and um, how you developed her as your character. So I began with the premise that I did not, I wanted to start fresh. I wanted to start with a younger character. Uh -huh. um, I didn't want to start, as many of us do that are retired uh, military or, or police force, we tend to start with the jaded veteran because that's who we are when, when we retire, right? <laughs> right. Um, but I didn't want to do that with the series. I wanted to start with a rookie CAA operative right out of Georgetown, right out of the farm, just beginning her career. Um, I had started to develop Talia's character when I realized what I was creating was uh, a rookie 
from uh, 20 years ago when I would have been a rookie. Mm -hmm. um, and the rookie of 20 years ago of, of, of my generation is not the same as the rookie of today. And, and fortunately, staying in for as long as I did, I, I had the opportunity to work in intelligence with the up and coming generation. And so I got a, a good understanding of them. And, and I tried to, to push some of that into, into Talia. Um, and so Talia is complex. Talia is a former foster kid. Uh, she has lost both parents. Uh, lost her father obviously plays a significant role um, in, in the story. And she really needs to learn and understand forgiveness she you know bouncing around the, the foster care system in washington dc has created some of that bitterness um, she's angry at god and so um talia you know i started to write a story about morality and espionage mm -hmm. but talia took over the story and she <laughs> became this, this really i mean it's, we still do an exploration of morality and espionage yeah. but the focus of the story is talia's bitterness um, which makes her a little bit abrupt uh, uh, and frustrating in the first, uh, you know, half of the book before she begins to, to learn. Um, and then uh, and, and her uh, understanding of her need for healing and the need to be able to forgive others in order to heal and even potentially to forgive uh, someone who has, has wronged you to the level of, of killing a parent. Yeah, yeah. She she's frustrating to me too. And I and I think okay, this is more showing my age than hers. <laughs> But, but you do, I mean, you do understand just from what she's gone through and you do a really good job with that, with that characterization oh, and not only her, but the other. So also, I, I just want to tell everybody, you've got to look at James's website because there's a wonderful trailer on there for, for this book. And it's just, it's just amazing. And it reminded me of Leverage, which is a television show. Are you familiar with it? You know, the hitter, thief, grifter, you know, mastermind and, and, and I love it too, but your story has been compared to um, Ocean's Eleven meets Mission Impossible. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I do appreciate that. <laughs> that's, that's so, so cool. Well, I've gotten me. some uh, some James Bond comments, which I uh, oh, really? wasn't going for, but I'll take it. I, I will definitely <laughs> take it. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. Was well, there anything else you can tell us about that terrorist chasing you down? <laughs> Well, you know what? It is my it is it is it is my pride and my shame. Um, we were I was in Germany. I was a young fighter pilot. Uh, my wife and I. Uh, the base was split. You had uh, Spengdalem Air Base, which had uh, three of the fighter squadrons, and you had the Bitburg Annex, which was a base where the runways and the flying squadrons shut down, and it had all the facilities. So if you wanted to go to the gym or the commissary to do grocery shopping and things like that, you had to travel from Spengdalen to the base at Bitburg. And my wife and I lived on the German economy in between. Mm. Um, and so we were driving home from the gym. Uh, and this lone wolf uh, Turkish guy uh, who was, uh, had, was acting on his own, uh, decided from contacts that he'd had uh, on the internet that he was going to take out an American military family. Oh, and wow. so uh, he pulls up behind us in this beat up red opal and starts uh, and, and pulls out a, a weapon, um, a, a plated, a nickel plated pistol. And the frustrating thing for me is I had just been to the gym and had done a heavy arm workout. And so I had asked my wife to drive. Now, nowadays, oh. Cindy drives me everywhere because my other job is airline pilot. I'm always driving people around. <laughs> um, so when I'm home, Cindy drives. Uh, and, you know, she really earned her stripes that day. She was like Mario Andretti. We're on this, the B-50, which is one of the, the most devastating roads in all of Germany in terms of accidents. It's the second most deadly road in all of Germany. Windy, turny, sheer drop-offs through the, through the Bavarian or the, through the, the uh, Eiffel Woods. And you've got this guy right on our six. Um, I mean, so close I couldn't get a read on his license plate. And Cindy is pedal to the metal going around those corners. I'm like, if, if only I could have been in, in the seat, I could talk about how I drove. No, nope, I was, uh, oh, good job, honey. Wait, honey, go. Way to go, honey. Go, some brakes, honey. Um, uh, and so we drove to the police station in Bitburg. Uh, and that, the guy went flying by. Um, the next, we went and reported it to the base. This was pre-9-11. The security forces didn't take us seriously. Um, they're like, oh, you, maybe he was working out while he was in the car. And that's what you, like, no, he was so close on my six. I know what a weapon looks like. 
Um, and the next day he tried on foot to take out an American couple. Oh um, and an off-duty security forces young man saw them across from across the street and uh, dove in front of them and took the guy down and uh, weapon and all and, and captured him. So, uh, oh, what a story! Anyway, wow. so uh, it it is a great it was a great story being chased by a terrorist. But the fact is that my wife gets all the credit for just masterful James Bond driving. I feel <laughs> bad about laughing because she must have been scared out of her mind. I mean, just wow. Well, That's, we were we both were as a guy behind the stations with a gun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you were. I mean, and now it's like, oh my, we're laughing about this, but at the time, it must have been just absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> it also, because you go to all these countries in, in, in the Griffin Heights, it reminds me of, I, I mean, all kinds of movie references here. Born Identity, which is one of my, I love the Born franchise. And I'm like, oh, we're going to all these fun places in Europe. This is so cool. So. I like this. I love, I, I, I enjoy the places and I, the reason that Conrad is in the story is so that we can enjoy some of the food of those oh. places. It's not the entire reason. Conrad has some wisdom to share and a yeah. bit of a mysterious background, but with all those places, I don't, I, it, something that sometimes gets missed in all the beautiful scenery is the culinary aspect. And so even though it's a, it's an action spy thriller, I, I wanted to bring in some of the good food and, and, and Conrad was my vehicle for doing that. That is great. And we should say, so he, uh, James brings all these characters together and they sort of have a, this base and then Conrad is like the butler and the chef and the, the do all. But you do know, I mean, you can tell there's more to him than, than, than just that. He's, he's more than just the butler. <laughs> Something in the way he wields that butcher knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cuts those carrots. <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit about your other books because you write all these great books for adults, but you write books for kids too. So, and I think you have at least one to show us as well. So I, I do. Um, the third book in that series, which was Clockwork Dragon, um, came out in February, and that's the Section Thirteen Mystery Fantasy series. Uh, the The Lost Property Office began that series in two thousand sixteen. Um, it's uh, Jack Buckles is a uh, American boy, he's a kid from Colorado that goes to London in search of his missing father, who he understands is, is you know, as is, is an international salesman, businessman. Um, but what he discovers when he gets there as his, as his sister runs off in the city uh, and he has to chase her is that he's been drawn here by a villain and there is much more to his family than meets the eye. And, and Jack discovers that he's part of a secret society detectives. He's the 13th in a long line um, and his father's been kidnapped. And so he embarks on an adventure, one, to solve a historical mystery, the Great Fire of London, uh, and two, to rescue his father and stop a madman from recreating that fire. And so the, that series grew from the Lost Property Office which there's a whole great story behind Lost Property Office and Baker Street and Sherlock Holmes and how that all came about. But oh um, that story grew into The Fourth Ruby and The Clockwork Dragon. Uh, and there are four major secret societies come out of London. There are the, uh, the trackers who are sort of the Sherlock Holmes detectives. There's the oh. Ministry of Dragons, the Dragos, and they are the, the knights. They are the Arthurian knights. You have the uh, Ministry of Secrets, and they are more like the Merlins uh, and the spies, the MI6. Uh, and then you have uh, the Ministry of Guilt, and they're the money people, a little bit greedy, a little bit money grubbing. Um, and, but underneath them, you have really cool stuff. You have all the different guilds, like the Tinker's Guild and the Magician's Guild. You know, all of the Tinker's Guild just wants to be left to their own devices. That is fascinating, and I love that you're bringing in all these all these other things too, like you know Sherlock. I, I really like Sherlock Holmes. I'm actually watching the Benedict Cumberbatch one for the oh, second yes. time. Oh yes, he's fantastic. I, he is fantastic. I I love that. So so that you've got oh my gosh, you like the Griffin Heist. It is so complicated, so complex, and then you've got these stories, and they sound like even though they're for kids, that they're pretty complex too. So that's really that makes me want to. <laughs> <laughs> and grab one and read those to see how you're doing that. Did you always want to be a writer? I mean, I know you've had this whole other career, but has this been a long time dream that's now being fulfilled or how did, how did that happen? 
I, you know, I've wanted to be a writer since I was a kid. I attempted to write my first book when I was four. It was mostly plagiarized, some pandas uh, playing soccer. There may have been a raccoons playing soccer book we had just checked out from the library. Of course. Um, <laughs> my first short story, um, I got the chance to read on the radio in fifth grade. Um, so my poetry was published in high school. And then I went into the military at 17. And was, you know, that, that was my life for the next 10 years. And so I really didn't start writing again until I got out and, and began with Wraith. But I always, I always have wanted to tell and create stories. Um, what I learned when I got out and began attending conferences like Thriller Fest, learning from masters like David Morrell and Steve mm -hmm. Berry and Clive Custler, is that, that it's not just the desire to tell stories, but there is a, a craft and an art. And yeah. so... Um, I, and, you know, I'm working on book 10 right now, and, and it has been a long road of learning uh, since I started this. That's great, though. That's great. Well, this has been, been just wonderful. So once again, we want to show the Griffin Heist. <laughs> well done. And watch the trailer because it is amazing too. It's a lot of fun. Um, I always ask everybody before I let them say goodbye, <laughs> what do you do to unwind? When you finished a book, when you hit the end, you're all done with it, what do you do? I'll tell you what, we are taking a break today in the midst of writing, which is normally <laughs> something we would do uh, at the end is, um, we're, we're doing a, a family movie day. Oh. And we call it Hobbit Day, so this is all Tolkien related. Yeah. Um, and we were supposed to actually do it on Saturday, but uh, our city flooded. Um, and uh -oh. so we were doing relief efforts and dealing with leaky roofs and, and mudding out homes and things like that. So we have regrouped. And today is our unwind day with uh, <laughs> a movie, Tolkien movie marathon. Oh, uh, that's wonderful. We used to do that with Lord of the Rings, and we haven't done that in a while. We're just the whole day. We make Limbus bread. I mean, the whole, you know. Oh, that's because my wife is, is making Limbus bread <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I will let you get to that. Thank you so much for being my guest today. I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And everybody, we're so glad you're here. Check out James's books, not just his latest one, but also those Section 13 books, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they sound really fascinating. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time on Novelist Unwind.